The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So that was using an imagination to actually to get you uh, to start feeling what it's like to be peaceful. It's almost like jump-starting, getting ahead very quickly. But as soon as I started that, I realized, actually, that was not the kids' meditation I was referring to. But nevertheless, it was good. I thought, no, I'm not going to stop this, I'm going to indulge. Because the kids' meditation, which I uh, found, you can develop your own kids' meditation, was over in uh, Perth, you know, some kids, they wanted to meditate. They're about seven, eight, nine years of age. And I asked them again to use imagination. I, and I repeated this when I was in, in Singapore. They wanted to have kids doing meditation with me, but the parents were there. And I told them, this is how I teach the kids. And I got the kids to close your eyes. And I imagine you're really relaxed. And imagine you're floating out of your body and flying above the, the houses in Singapore, flying over the city over into the ocean to your own little private spot in your own little private island. No one else can, uh, can go there, only you. And you land so softly on the warm, silky sand. And you're sitting under this beautiful palm tree, keeping you cool. And a soft wind is blowing over the ocean not too hot, not too cold. And the sea is calm. There's a few ripples on the ocean. As the ocean ripples, they just come up the beach and recede away again. And there's no one to disturb you at all there. Parents and teachers are not allowed on that island. <laughs> it's your special place. And you're sitting there and there's a nice a uh, drink of like coconut water, if you want coconut water, or orange juice. It's just there, you just lift up your hand, and it's just there, you can take a drink. But you don't really need to drink very much, because it's so relaxing and so peaceful. And maybe you, you can see a, a dolphin just playing close to you, just saying hello. And a beautiful white seagull just drifting in the breeze just to entertain you. And there's nothing which is missing there. There's no little brothers and sisters to annoy you. This is your private, special place. And you're sitting there nice and peaceful. And I, I spend much more time describing it in the guided meditation. Now it's time for you to come back. So say goodbye to your friend, the little dolphin. Say goodbye to the seagull. And then imagine just rising up above the warm, comfortable sand, flying up and over the ocean, over the beach, over the houses, and back into this room. And you're back again with your friends. And now open your eyes. When I did that with the kids, they loved it. Because, again, it was not intellectual, it was more emotional, feely-feely. And number two, when I was doing that because the parents had to be there, they really got into it more than the kids did. <laughs> they say, watching the breath, forget it. <laughs> Sweeping the body, yeah, be there, but just my own little private island. And, you know, you can imagine it just what you like. Just, you know, for me, instead of like a nice little coconut milk, it would be a nice cup of tea. Mm -hmm, beautiful. Just the right amount of tea and sweetener. Mm. Custom made. <laughs> and then you find the kids love that. And you do that for them a few times and soon they can do it by themselves. Because the kids' imagination is great. And that imagination is very powerful. And it's the imagination which sets up the mind to go in a certain direction. So, I don't know how many of you enjoyed also imagining you're a Buddha. That has even steeper uh, power 
because many of you know a Buddha has no craving left, no ill will, totally free. And you just imagine that, imagine what it must be like being a Buddha. And when you can imagine that, it's like you're almost there. You're almost like, ah, a person without any wanting. You get a taste of it and it's just so delightful. It's a, the mind gets attracted to that and you get peaceful and you go even further and deeper into peacefulness. So just some nice little techniques of how to meditate, especially the easy ways. Instead of just watching the breath go in, go out, watching the breath go in, go out. Have you ever noticed by, say, watching the breath, that sometimes what happens is your mind wanders off? What are you told? Bring the mind back. Then it wanders off again, bring it back. Wanders off again, bring it back. And after about five or six years of that, <laughs> bring it back, bring it back. What's going on? It's not working. And then, so as a good meditator, you don't just follow instructions. You ask why. Why does my mind not want to stay with my breathing? Why does it keep wandering off? I bring it back, I don't scold it, and then it wanders off again. Why is the mind restless? And soon the answer became so clear, it's because me and my breath had a very bad relationship. I always try to control my breath. Breath, you go in, now you come out, and mind, you watch that breath. I was a control freak. And I developed the simile of getting a phone call from your friend, maybe on a, a Sunday afternoon, or Saturday afternoon, I don't know. And your friend says, oh, are you free this afternoon? You say, oh yeah, I, I am to be free. Say, oh great, can you come to this wonderful coffee shop in, uh, like, like, like on Street, yeah. And like on Road. Like on Street, yeah. Supposed to be famous for coffee. Yeah, okay. I know it's a wonderful coffee shop in Like on Street. So, what, are you free? Can you come? Well, well yeah. Um, great, because they make incredibly delicious uh, flat whites. Do they have flat whites or long blacks or something? I don't know. I just have a cup of coffee. A flat, flat blacks. <laughs> no, they're not flat blacks. <laughs> I have a flat white. I know you don't usually like flat whites, but you know I do, so you're gonna have one too. And no sugar, and we're gonna have a a, uh, a biscuit because their biscuits they have there are delicious, which actually brings me up to. Um, I know. So we just had Waysack, but an Easter we also had. Anzac Day here? Yeah, okay. So there was the the joke about I can't I can't resist jokes. <laughs> there was the Englishman <laughs> the Englishman, the Irishman, the Scotsman and the Australian. They went to a pub one evening. Obviously not Buddhists. Maybe they were, I don't know. <laughs> and the Englishman said this evening the drinks are on me because my wife just gave birth to my first child, a son. And because today is St. George's Day, patron saint of the English, therefore I decided I'm going to call my son George and the drinks are on me. And the Scotsman said, oh, that's really strange. He said, because my first son was born on St. Andrew's Day patron saint of, of, of Scotland. So I named my son Andrew. Wow, said the Irishman, what a coincidence. My first son was born on St. Patrick's Day, so I called him Paddy. <laughs> and the Australians said, well, you know, we don't have really a patron saint of Australia, do we? So he said, when my first son was born, he was born on Anzac Day, so I called him Biscuit. Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> and that's an original Ajahn Brahm joke. You know, sometimes I make up these jokes. I don't follow other ones. <laughs> and anyway, where do I get to on this one? Uh, oh, yeah, flat white. And you have a, a biscuit. And we're going to sit in the back, in the corner, because that's where I like to sit. And we're going to talk about politics. None of this spirituality, meditation, Buddhism, mumbo-jumbo, none of that rubbish. This is important stuff. Politics and the economy. And I've got one hour, so we're going to sit there for one hour. And if your friend gives you a call, tells you what you're going to drink, what you have to eat, where you're going to sit, for how long, and what you're going to talk about, who wants to stay with someone like that? So she makes up an excuse. She says, oh, I'm sorry, I just remembered. I've got a dentist appointment this afternoon. <laughs> oh, what a shame. Maybe next time. And you hang up. And then, because you're a Buddhist, and you, you, know, you can't lie, you very quickly ring up your dentist to make an appointment. <laughs> Uh, an emergency appointment to keep your precepts. <laughs> and then after you made the appointment, another friend rings up. And the friend says, oh, are you free this afternoon? Oh, I just made an appointment with the dentist. Oh, that's such a shame. Because I heard about the, your favorite coffee shop in the, you know, the back streets of, of you know, St. Kildare or somewhere. And he said, not many people know about that, but he said, the coffee there is just so, the lattes are just so delicious. And I really want to try one. And I know you always, you know, you want to say the, the chocolate chip muffins are to die for. They're like what you must eat in heaven. You know, they're just so incredibly delicious. So, you know, I, I would like to try one too. I don't usually, and I, I like, I usually like sitting in the back, but you like sitting in the front, so I like sitting in the front too with you. And I wanted to find out about this Buddhism and meditation business. I know I'm usually an atheist, not concerned about all this stuff, but, you know, it makes you so peaceful. I'm interested. Now, if somebody wants to drink the type of coffee you like and eat what you like to eat and sit where you want to sit and talk about what interests you, she said, OK, I'll be there in half an hour. I'm cancelling the appointment <laughs> with the dentist. And you sit there and the hours go by so easily, so quickly. Because you're with someone who is caring and kind to you. And time doesn't have any meaning anymore. You're enjoying talking about things which interest you, drinking coffee which you really like, chocolate chip muffins which you adore, talking about what you want to talk about. And you will find that you spend a lot of time having a wonderful afternoon. What is the meaning of that simile? So some people say, okay, time to meditate, sit down. I've got one hour, one hour, and we're going to watch the, no, we're going to do Vipassana, not your silly breath meditation. We're going to do Vipassana, this is serious stuff. And not what you want to do, what I want to do. We're going to do it for one hour, and you're not going to move, and you're going to do it this way and not another way, and you're not going to sit on the chair like some softy. We're going to sit directly on the concrete. We're real tough. People like that, no wonder your mind is scared of you, will run away. You're always telling it what to do and how to do it. So, but if you're with somebody, you sit here and say, hi mind, how are you today? Good to see you again. Hi breath, how are you doing? And when you're so kind to your breath, breath, what do you want to do? Do you want to go in this way or that way? And if you're kind to your mind like that, to your breath, you have this wonderful relationship with meditation. Oh, if you fall asleep, it's fine. I won't scold you, because I'm kind to you. You must be so tired. So if that was the case, if you're really so kind to your mind, of course your mind will stay with you, because it lo loves you. It cares for you, as you care for it. And then you find there's no such thing as restlessness anymore. The mind doesn't want to escape. Who wants to escape and run away from someone who's so kind and loving and forgiving? 
So that's the reason why people are restless. They try and force their mind to do this and do that. Instead of your mind realizing, okay mind, whatever you want to do is fine by me. And then your mind sticks with you. Me in meditation, because I have to do so many different things in my job, every time I have the opportunity to cross my legs, shut my eyes, and shut my mouth. <laughs> it's like my breath and I, hey, we're back again, yeah, let's hang out together. There's no force required. It's like good friends meeting again and hanging out together, chilling out with no effort at all. So if you are restless, it means you've got a wrong attitude to your mind. You're trying to drain it trying to develop it, trying to make it different, trying to improve it. And improving your mind means that you're not happy with your mind, you think there's something wrong with it, and needs tuning up or whatever. But that's going to cause you a lot of ill will. The fellow went, I think I told this story last year, the fellow went to the bookshop, went to the counter and said, can you please tell me where the self-help books are. And the receptionist said, so if I told you where the self-help books are, it would defeat the purpose. <laughs> oh, that little girl could come any time to my talks. <laughs> I'll give you a free ticket to this evening's Box Hill Comfort. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is actually just you know, how meditation really works. We use wisdom, power, kindness, joy, and that is much more powerful than force. Being kind to your mind. So if ever you're struggling with your meditation, Sometimes you ask yourself, mind, what do you want right now? Body, what do you want? Be mindful of what your body requires. And sometimes the body needs a stretch, or needs a scratch, or needs some exercise. So give it some exercise. Sometimes the mind, I just want to rest a bit. So you give your body a rest, and your mind a rest. If you work, if you work with your mind, rather than trying to control it, You'll find after a while the mind works with you. And then the mind says, Wow, such a beautiful person to work with. And so your body um, doesn't ever rebels. And it actually just looks after you. And your mind looks after you as well. Have some wonderful times together in deep meditation. Never underestimate kindness in this meditation. So anyway, uh, some comments or questions about the meditation. Yeah. Um, how about inner chat? Like, inner chat. Okay. The inner conversation. Sometimes uh, inner chat, it becomes like a habit. What are you chatting about? Imagine that if we could somehow get a machine, we could amplify that and can play it to everybody in the room here what you're thinking about when you're meditating. Would you be embarrassed? My goodness you would be. <laughs> because if you had to look at that in a chat, it's like just a bad book. Sometimes, as some monks, we can read minds sometimes. And as soon as if, you know, if I said I was going to read your mind and tell everybody else what you were thinking, oh my goodness, you'd run away. But honestly, monks who can do such things, they only read a couple of minds and never again. <laughs> it's like reading bad novel. <laughs> a rubbish book. <laughs> Quite frankly, you know, without demeaning you, your minds aren't worth reading. <laughs> Is that being honest? Yeah. So anyway, so when you have an inner conversation or inner chat, just 
And then stand back from it and listen to what on earth is going on there. Why am I just chatting about this so much? And then when you, f you detach a little bit from it, take away the emotional entanglement, then you find it's rubbish. And the simile which uh, helps to teach other people is um, going, now I do travel a lot, and even tomorrow I'll be going through Singapore, tomorrow, next day or something, going through Singapore airport, just transiting there, and on the way to uh, the next meditation retreat in Thailand. And uh, I notice in, in Terminal 3 in Changi Airport that there is the sports lounge. And there when you go past the sports lounge, usually I see like recordings of uh, Premier League soccer matches. And I see all these guys sitting in the seats, watching, you know, maybe Manchester play Liverpool or something like that. And you see them standing out and shouting, that wasn't a foul, that is not offside, that's not a penalty, that's wrong, and they're shouting at the screen. <laughs> and these are supposed to be intelligent people. Number one, doesn't matter how loud you shout and scream, in Singapore, they cannot hear you in England. <laughs> and number two, it's a recording, it's a playback. The match was over a long time ago. <laughs> so all of that screaming and shouting, the emotional entanglement, it's a waste of time. But why do people do that? is because when you're watching a movie or watching, say, a, a soccer match on TV, you get actually, like, drawn in to the TV. You get entangled and involved in it, and it's like you're in the stands watching it. That's the psychology of it. It draws you in, and you're right there. The same thing happens when you're watching a movie. When you're watching a movie, the reason I know about Game of Thrones, I've never seen it, but it was, it was a recording it, not recording it, telling the latest results in the ABC News site. You know what, uh, Addy, the two major things they were showing on the ABC News site was the, uh, the Australian election, Indian election, Brexit, and the Game of Thrones finale. And what's real and what's fantasy? <laughs> but anyway, that whenever you watch a movie, have you ever, what was it that when I was a student, I went with, our, no, with my friends, my male friends and our girlfriends, we went to see um, the movie West Side Story. Anyone my age remembers that? <laughs> and it had this really sad finale. When Tony, Tony was the um, Italian migrant, was with Maria, oh no, I think Tony was Puerto Rican. Now one was Puerto Rican, one was, was Italian. You know, both sort of refugees, you know, really struggling to get by in life. But they met and they fell in love. It's one of these love matches which was doomed from the start. And the very end scenes, there was Maria was trying to warn the love of her life that her, her brother had a gun and was trying to find him and shoot him to kill him. She was trying to warn him through the streets of New York for the West Side late at night. And this was in the 60s. And, and she finally saw him under a lamppost in the wet and the cold and she shouted out, Tony! And at that was followed by the, 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 the report of a gun because um, Marie, uh, Maria's brother had also found him at the same time. And Maria ran towards the love of his life, of her life, as he was dying under the lamppost in New York. And <laughs> in the middle of the night, I've been in New York. And in the middle of the night, there was an orchestra 
and an orchestra started playing. And instead of calling an ambulance, this stupid young couple started singing, there's a place for us, somewhere a place for us. <laughs> Call an ambulance, stupid! Peace and quiet. <coughs> <laughs> And I remember that because <laughs> all the guys, we started laughing. That's stupid. No one just starts singing when someone's just been shot. <laughs> and all our girlfriends, every one of them was crying. We were... <laughs> so why were you crying? It's only a movie, but you get involved, you get sucked in. It really was as if they were some of the best friends of Maria and Tony. <laughs> they were part of the family. And they were actually there. Sometimes they'd even shout out, Hey, look! You know, someone's going to shoot you! <laughs> Have you ever seen people shouting at the cinema like that? Hey, look out behind you! Alien is coming! Because you get involved. You get sucked in. And that's just with the fantasies and thoughts in your mind. You get sucked in, as if that's more real than life. And if you can just stand back, put some separation, detachment, some space between you and those thoughts, so you can actually be mindful of them without getting really entangled in them, you'll find this is going nowhere. These aren't really important thoughts. These plans are probably will never work out that way. So you can let them go. And then they disappear. Don't get entangled. Don't get sucked in. And then you can have peace instead. The inner peace is much more powerful <coughs> than the, uh, all those thoughts. So that's why, you know, why do people get emotionally involved in movies? Oh, it's so sad. Oh, it's so exciting. I wonder what's going to happen next. And I think the reason is, apparently, I, mean, I might be wrong on this, but the most popular dramas these days are Korean drama. Is that right? Korean drama? Not anymore. Okay, well, apparently there were in many countries. In Malaysia, Malaysia, Korean drama, so... Well, don't you have enough problems in your own country <laughs> to worry about what happens with Korean families in, on the TV? <laughs> it's something I've always noticed as well, that sometimes people, they have to have some drama in their life. If they don't have any drama in their life, they have a happy family and a nice group of acquaintances, that sometimes uh, someone must be wrong. So we create a drama to create some excitement. I even notice that in monasteries, you know, sometimes people go nice and peaceful, and then a drama happens. As if it's like, you know, people find it so difficult to live a life when everything goes peaceful and quiet. We have to create a drama. So we're addicted to dramas. Just like our great Buddhist Society of Victoria, they're a wonderful committee, and they got a new committee introduced yesterday. And a beautiful, lovely committee, and then what happens? It goes nice and peaceful, and then there'll be a drama happens sooner or later. <laughs> I think, why? No need for one. Yeah, I know, well, you know, it just gives us something to do. <laughs> that psychology is interesting. The need to have a drama in life. Anyway, you can check that one out. So anyway, another question? Wow, lots of questions coming up now. Yes. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, how can someone use meditation to help with um, con compulsive disorder or addiction? Oh. Yeah. You. The ADHD, compulsive disorder. But sometimes by using a little bit of mindfulness and kindness. Uh, because, you know, first of all, the wisdom is that there's no such thing as permanent attention deficit disorder. Because, you know, sometimes if you find something you really like and enjoy, 
you just want to do it. Sometimes by forcing yourself to pay attention to things which you don't really like doing, you know, of course that makes it worse, a rebelliousness in the mind. So if you ask any psychologist, and of course I've worked with many psychologists, psychiatrists, neuroscientists, that, you know, sometimes we label people, and labeling is a very dangerous thing. Because as soon as you label, oh, this is your disorder, then actually, amazing, people actually uh, become that disorder. They find out the symptoms, oh, that's me. That sometimes that we have things like, I don't know if you believe in horoscopes, but in, in uh, astrology, but sometimes I would read out someone's horoscope to them. I said, this is your horoscope. I said, well, hey, that's me. I said, oh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong one. You know that sometimes uh, giving a gift to a monk who wants for nothing, what can you give a monk? So it was my birthday one year and very smart, he was actually a lawyer and he had this wonderful idea to get me an official expensive horoscope for the next year. <laughs> he knew my birthday, August the 7th, and he also, he managed to get out of me what I thought was the time of my birth. And so he paid his very, I don't know how much, to get a horoscope of me in. And at my birthday celebration, he said, I paid a lot of money for this horoscope. Can I please read it out? Yeah, sure. Interesting. And it started out by saying, for anyone born on the 7th of August, 1951, at this particular time, this year, it was quite a few years ago now, this year will be a very good year for romance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still a monk, so I don't believe in horoscopes anymore. <laughs> but you know, some people think, oh yeah, wow, wow, and they would believe in that, and they'd go and do it. But uh, when you give people a label, they tend to actually believe that label and they become that label. In Opening the Door of Your Heart, I wrote the story of the two classes of children who were examined at the end of the year. And uh, the uh, results were never published. Only the principal and two psychologists who actually knew the real results. But these two classes of children, they split up equally. The child who came first, fourth, fifth, eighth, ninth, twelfth, thirteenth, when in one class. The children who came second, third, sixth and seventh, tenth and eleventh, when in another class. Evenly split. The principal chose classrooms with equal facilities, teachers who they thought were just equally able, everything as equal as possible except one thing. They labeled one class A and the other one class B. They were totally equal. But what would happen if your kid, surprisingly, because he'd never done any homework, was in class A? Wow, well done, son. I never expected that, you know, with the laziness and the reports from your teachers, you came good on the exam. You're class A, well done. And other kids, you know, these poor girls who just done so much extra homework, you're in class B, right, no more lessons in ballet, no more going out, you are doing extra studies so you can get back into class A. They assume that class A was better than class B. And after one year they gave the exam again and the people in class A did exactly as you would have thought if they had been the top half from the year before. And people in class B did terribly. They actually believed their label. They became class B children. When I saw that result, that was, that was scary. We label children at an early age, and they become that. Somebody labels you ADHD, Asperger's or something, and you actually live up to that diagnosis sometimes. So be careful. Careful of labels. But we obviously have to use those labels sometimes. But no, don't actually just be a prisoner of the label. That's why I sometimes say that people just 
they have these mental illnesses, but they're not there all the time. My cough has been here all week, but it's not there all the time. When I meditate, it's not there. When I sleep, it's not there. In a couple of days, it'll be gone. So I'm not a, a coughing monk. <laughs> it's only temporary. I may have Asperger's, but it's not there all the time. So be careful of those labels. So what meditation does is meditation makes you a little bit more uh, rebellious. You're aware and you think for yourself. You challenge. Just like a Buddha. You know, all the, the great teachers were radicals. Ajahn Chah was a radical. He didn't do things the way other people did. That's why he was always really interested. Interesting. Breaking new ground. In a wise way. According to the Buddha's principles, even the Buddha, you know, many people didn't like the Buddha. Taking away people from the family. But the Buddha went ahead because this was wise, this was excellent stuff he was doing. So, I challenge a little bit. Anyway, another question before I spend all the time giving answers instead of listening to questions. It's uh, uh, grateful to see you in Melbourne, Ajahn Brahm. I just want to ask if, before I start meditation, and sometimes if I use a heart sutra to start my meditation, or sometimes during my meditation, I got interrupted, um, and I channeled heart sutra, will that be okay? If it's in the beginning, it'll be okay. If you find it inspiring, because inspiration is a beautiful way to start your meditation. I've had some of my best meditations after getting, listening to an incredible talk by someone like an Ajahn Chah. So inspiring, just really getting so into your heart. Afterwards, just sit down and just meditation just goes easily. Because inspiration gives you free burst of energy. Of course, it won't work for everybody, a heart sutra. So it's really up to you to find out what inspires you. If it may be just like the Waysack full moon, if you really get into that, if you see the Waysack full moon, that is inspirational. And wow, you really love that. And just you know, see the full moon rise in the sky. You sit down, wow. Close your eyes and you're, you're just in deep meditation really quickly. So if you can use inspiration, it's a wonderful thing. You've got an announcement. Okay, now, okay. So it can be used, but I wouldn't use it in the middle of the meditation. Because it just, you know, the, any chanting and anything complicated at the beginning of the meditation, but in the middle, keep it nice and simple. Simple, the better. Okay, well, there's lots of questions all over the place. Right in the back there, at the back, because they're the humble people. Hi there. Um, the question that I had was on behalf of my mother. Now, she's stuck in this samadhi state while she's meditating. What advice can you give her to sort of overcome that stagnant state and move forward? Stagnant? Enjoy it. <laughs> well, that's, that's her words, not mine. Yeah. But. If it's stagnant, I doubt if it's really samadhi. It's more like dullness and sleepiness. Because if it's very still, the energies keep on increasing. You get deeper and deeper and deeper into peace. So you may be meditating and seeing just the, the breath, and after a while the breath vanishes. And you get this beautiful light in the mind, the nimittas, gorgeous lights, like the sun. And so often, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not static, it's not stagnant. It gets very bright, and brighter and brighter and brighter. And sometimes, happens. I, mean, I have to give this warning because certainly that this happened to me, I thought I was going to go blind, it's too bright. And then you have to remember that you're seeing this with the mind, not with the physical eye. So it's no danger at all. And sometimes it's so blissful. But the other thing, and again, I'm not just, um, just uh, blowing my own trumpet as they say, but Sometimes it's so blissful, you just wonder, can a human being take so much pleasure? And you can. It's 
wonderful thing to love, but it actually grows. And it gets, you know, go into that bliss. And you get in great, incredible jhanas. And when you come out afterwards, hindrances are gone. There's no negativity left at all. So you can tell if it's a person who's been in samadhi. I'll tell you some of my tricks. If that's your mother, and she's just exited from samadhi, and said, nah, no, people like you can't get samadhi. <laughs> and I look for her reaction. And if she gets upset and angry, I said, okay, that was certain, it wasn't samadhi. But if, she's, <laughs> if she's nice and peaceful and kind, okay, never mind. And I said, okay, that was samadhi. So that's actually how you know how deep it is. And so it's never stagnant, it's a beautiful state. It's powerful, really joyful. And what was it even? Amazing stuff happens. It's one of these gentlemen in Sri Lanka. He follows my teaching. Last time I saw him a year or two ago, he said that one of the students could really good at getting into the jhanas. And the, this teacher fellow was a doctor. So I decided to do some experiments on the fellow while he was in deep meditation. He got out a scalpel and tried to cut his arm. And the scalpel wouldn't cut. It wouldn't penetrate the skin. And it was, I thought that was pretty weird. So the next time he said, may I have your permission next time to actually to make an incision on your arm? And with permission, this fellow went into the deep meditation. And the doctor videoed it and just made an incision. And it's obviously without anesthetic, but you know, with, um, what's it called, uh, the antibiotics to make sure, not antibiotics, but sterilizing the area. And it was just normal. He didn't flinch, didn't make any, because he was in deep meditation. And then he stitched it up afterwards, put a bandage on it, no problem. Weird stuff happens in deep meditation. So, to test whether your mother is really in deep meditation. <laughs> okay. I had another broad question, if time permits. Um, what is your definition of happiness? Of happiness? is letting go contentment, having nothing in the whole world. The happiness of freedom. Just like sometimes people think, oh, happiness is just being able to go wherever you want, whenever you want. But happiness is not really needing to go anywhere. Happiness is not striving for something new. It's contentment with what you already have. And just see how more you can give away, it would be simple. Happiness is peace. Other types of happiness which depend upon your ownership and control of things, your health, your reputation, your wealth and your family, those things are impermanent and they're out of control. Sometimes they will just vanish and disappear. But if your happiness just depends upon stillness and peace, that by its very nature is born of letting go. So it's indestructible. Ajahn Brown, what is depression according to Buddhism? What is depression? It's low energy, low mental energy. And because we don't like depression, we just take away whatever energy is left. We don't know how to deal with that. So, if you have low energy, just take a rest. Don't fight it, don't stigmatize it. There's nothing wrong with having low energy. It's part of life. So, when we don't stigmatize it, but we have our strategies, if you have low energy, just take a rest, take a break, go on a retreat. And because you don't think there's something wrong with me, then you don't uh, fight it. <laughs> you don't fight it, it soon vanishes. Very, very low energy. Sometimes it comes from the idea of being controlling your body, your mind and the world around you. You get frustrated. And when you get frustrated because you can't do what you think you should be doing, 
then you fight really hard, many people do, you struggle, and that just drains the energy so quickly. And the energy gets so low, you get into this dull state, and you can't get out of it, it's like a deep hole where everything is grey and dark and nothing tastes good, nothing sort of uh, smells good, everything is really dull, colours are washed out, it's all grey. How do you get out of that? Just preserve your energy. And as soon it grows and grows and grows, and you float out of it. So, depression is born of expecting from this world what it can never give you. Uh, we have some online questions now. Okay. Uh, how does one deal with desire to commit suicide? He says the Buddhist, you can't commit suicide. As soon as you kill yourself, you're still there. You're only killing the body. The mind is still there afterwards, and that really sucks. <laughs> you can't do anything right. So basically, it's just uh, not really an option, because it doesn't work. So, if a person wants... To, usually what happens, though, if a person wants to commit suicide, they don't tell anybody. They go ahead and do it. But there's a way you can find out what they're up to, which I learned and I share this. Sometimes if you're in that uh, profession where you deal with people who get really depressed and negative in life, there's sometimes that, you know, your friend befriending them, counselling them, and then there comes a time they seem to perk up. They seem to be happy, they're smiling. They're not so depressed anymore. But be careful. Because that might be the symptom that they've finally made the decision they're going to do it. So they're not worried and tormented by should I, shouldn't I. So be careful. If suddenly someone is really depressed, contemplating suicide, and then very quickly it looks like they're over it, be really careful. But there was uh, this um, one of the caretakers of our centre in Perth. He was a really nice fellow. He decided to find some solitude by going into a country town in West Australia. And, but he got depressed one day. And he got so far as to tie a noose in the shed and the chair, all set up. And he was in his caravan writing his suicide note. And as he was writing his suicide note, he had the radio on. And as the radio was on, on the radio, on the ABC, came an interview with Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> and as soon as he heard, oh no, I can't escape from that blooming monk. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> he screwed up, the, screwed up the suicide note, untied the noose, and he came and told us a story years later. <laughs> so be careful. Good monk's eyes are everywhere. <laughs> no, it's, it's not a solution. It's only temporary at most. And um, yeah. I missed part of their question. Would meditation help suppress this desire? Not suppress it, but understand it and make sure you don't act on it. So suppression just makes it worse. So don't try and suppress anything. Understand it, first of all, the why. And then you can transcend it through wisdom, not through force. Suppressing it will just make it grow stronger. And um, how do you know when slash at what, what point in your practice to listen to your thoughts in meditation for more insight and clarity and when not to? Okay, the best time is now. Easy. Like, when's the best time to meditate? When's the worst time to meditate? Later. <laughs> so if that thought comes up, then just allow it to be. In other words, it's following that, what I said very early on in this uh, visit, the Empress Three Questions meditation. Now is the most important time, it's the only time you have. The only thing to do in life is to care, 
And the most important thing to do is the most important men, uh, object of meditation is the one right in front of you, right now. Whatever this is right now, that is your meditation object. Whatever this is. If it's unpleasant, it's there for a reason to teach you something. If it's pleasant, enjoy it, rest. This moment is important. And what we do with it is care for it. Be kind, learn from it. And if you're kind to life, life becomes kind to you. If you're kind to your own body, your body responds by being kind back. If you're kind to a, to a dog, the dog is kind back to you. You have a wonderful relationship. If you try and cure and change your husband, you make so much trouble. If you're kind and caring to him, he changes by himself. Try it out. Okay. We have one more question and then we'll have a little break and then we do some meditation to finish off. Can we go to 3.30? Forgive me, Ajahn Brahm, just about that uh, person who wanted to commit suicide. Oh, yeah? I just, do you mind if I just give a word of advice to that person? Because uh, it is important for that person to talk to someone and ask for help if they get suicidal thoughts. Because sometimes, you know, when they talk to someone, it, it can help them to get over the thoughts and get help. Be sometimes these suicidal thoughts are very impulsive and they do respond to, you know, talking to someone and getting help. Very Thank good. Thank you. Finish your three. Okay. So, um, yeah, we're half an hour. I just wanted to finish off with a, uh, a guided loving kindness meditation. Yeah. Because, sorry? Yeah, yeah. So, but if people want to have a quick stretch, first of all, we're sitting down a long time. I've stretched my mouth. Now I'm going to stretch my legs.